It's freezing, huh? But I have a topic today that I wanted to get into because there's, there are ideas that I want to keep circulating around that I think are possibly fading and um, I want to keep them alive in the community for study and, and thought and um, you know, meditation, prayer and discussion uh, over, the, over the time ahead. I call this talk Moses and End Time Geopolitics. Moses and End Time Geopolitics. Now, first of all, I don't want you to think that because I'm covering this subject that I think that we're in some kind of wrap-up period or a, a gun lap or whatever you want to, a term you want to use. Uh, that's not uh, what I'm saying. Uh, it's far from what I'm saying. But as I said, there are ideas I want to keep alive in the community. And the reason is because we as God's people should have an insight into prophecy uh, as uh, we see in John 15. In John 15, Jesus tells us in verse 14, by the way, just as a brief introduction, um, I'm Mark David Kaplan, and uh, I've been teaching uh, in the church all the way since 1969, and have been in the, in the ministry since 1984. So I, that's maybe about enough. Anyway, in uh, John 15 and verse 14, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Aha. Uh -huh. So now that we know what defines his friends, what does he say? He says in verse 15, no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So if we have a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, there should be certain things we know <laughs> about what God is doing, certain, certain insights that we would have that maybe others uh, don't have. So, and so that is why I, it's, I think this is a relevant subject, but it's not intended to, to get people, um, in, in, let's say, alarmed uh, unnecessarily. Uh, I want to go back and say that also what I'm talking about tonight is a subject that is a vast subject and really requires a lot of background in many ways. So what I'm going to do is in effect skim the surface and therefore get people interested in maybe getting into it further. Back around uh, after the First World War, uh, I guess you hopefully you can see the book I'm holding up. Uh, I'm holding up a book called Judah Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J. H. Allen. And I think the book that I have is copyright 1927. He also wrote in 1920 a book that's not well known, but it can be found in the University of Texas at Austin Library, where I found it, Hook 'em Horns. Uh, but also I see that it's also available now. It can actually be purchased. And he wrote the book, The National Rebirth of Judah in 1920, after the Balfour Declaration and the uh, capture of Jerusalem by General Allen being the First World War. So we had this book that many people know about, Judah Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. He also has another book called The National Rebirth of Judah. So we have this concept that the Northern Kingdom of, of ancient Israel, the kingdom that had the name Israel, the Southern Kingdom was Judah. They were, as you know, carried captive uh, into what is today Iraq uh, in uh, the, the 8th century BC. And over time, <clears throat> the idea goes, they migrated up into Central Asia or were driven there and then across Europe and uh, that the <clears throat> democratic nations of Northwest Europe are descendants of those lost tribes. It's an idea that is, has been talked about and discussed uh, as you see, it's been written about, but in recent years, it's been mainly uh, the, the best work on it has been done within God's church, people that I call commandment-keeping Christians in a, in a generic sense. And uh, back in 1942, Herbert W. Armstrong wrote a book, which I think it called The United States and British Commonwealth in Prophecy, and it went through various editions. But the best edition is one many of you may, may not have and I'm holding it up now. It's got a tan cover. 
and it was written after his death. I had a part in writing it. Uh, and that's one of the great thrills of my life because this is a subject I, I really enjoy talking about. Uh, and uh, so I was glad to have a part in, in, in this edition. This is the ninth edition and the final decent edition of the book. Later on, it was reduced to 60 pages uh, without illustration and then scrapped altogether. But uh, this ninth edition came out in 1986 after the death of Mr. Armstrong. And uh, the supervisor of this project was Dr. Herman Hay. Many of you have heard of him. The 125,000 copies of this ninth edition were made probably in March of 1986. This is the best uh, edition that I know of, of this, uh, on this subject. It, it, it gets rid of some of the problems that you'll find in Alan's book, and it gets rid of some of the problems you'll find in the earlier editions that the Worldwide Church of God published. So I'd recommend this one as a starting point. <clears throat> now, the, one of the things that I wrote about in there, I could have done a better job if I had known about a book. Well, I couldn't have known about it. It hadn't been written yet because this came out in 1986. <clears throat> but in 1989, a very wonderful book came out by the historian David Hack Hackett Fisher called Albion's Seed. Big, thick book, Albion's Seed. And um, this book uh, has, would, would be very helpful in studying this subject. And I noticed that later on, uh, I don't know how, I forget the date, or I never, I don't know if I know the date, but recently, uh, John O'Gwynn, he's not with us anymore, but uh, John O'Gwynn, who was uh, a scholar for the uh, Church of God, which is now called the Living Church of God, he wrote a booklet on this subject, and he m mentioned Albion Seed uh, in, in what he wrote, and uh, I would imagine that what he wrote was influenced by what was in the night that final edition in 1986 and very likely he collaborated with dr hay as well uh you know dr hay as i said was the one who mainly edited and and fixed up this this copy uh in 1986 dr hay of course is no longer with us either and john o'gwin's book i imagine was influenced by dr hay as well so that's some background if you wanted to do some of your own research a lot, a lot has been written on this and unfortunately much of it has has problems with it too. And this is an idea and concept which often is distorted and misapplied and, and sometimes misused. And the, the result has been that it is uh, highly therefore controversial and, and um, uh, sometimes discredited by the, <laughs> the sort of people who have made, who have misused it or have botched it up in many ways. All right, so, so I'm sorry about that, uh, but uh, we can, you know, you as you come across material, maybe you'll be able to discern, you know, uh, with God's help, you know, get, separate the wheat from the chaff. One thing I wanted to mention to everybody is that the 12 tribes of Israel are very important in the Bible, all the way from Genesis through Revelation, you find references to the 12 tribes. And <clears throat> it wouldn't surprise me if when we come to the conclusion and we have the world basically converted, if we wouldn't have humankind organized in 12 general categories, <clears throat> perhaps various Gentile nations connected through, through one of the tribes of Israel. So you might have that pattern of 12 all the way into the, uh, into the far future. That would seem to be the case, but that's a whole other subject as well. I want to go now to uh, Joshua, the eighth chapter. Joshua, the eighth chapter in verse 33. Joshua 8 and verse 33. And there you find that when the Israelites came into the promised land, in verse 33, I'm um, in Judges, I need to be in Joshua, back a little farther. Uh, in Joshua 8 and verse 33, you'll find that when they came into the promised land, they came to the biblical Shechem, <coughs> Shechem, in, in American pronunciation, and near the modern city of Nablus. And um, you go, it, we go to, uh, to Joshua 8.33, and almost every statement I make, I want to go on for you know, 20 minutes about one point or another, so I'm trying to control myself. <clears throat> There's a lot to this. But anyway, Joshua 8.33, Then all Israel, with their elders and officers and judges, stood on either side 
of the ark before the priests, the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the eternal. I'm um, in Joshua 8.33. The stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim. Uh, in, uh, I guess you say in Gerizim maybe in America. And half of them in front of Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the eternal, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. So we have Mount Ebal to the north, Mount Gerizim to the south. Mount Ebal is, is uh, higher, is the highest point there. Mount Ebal is slightly lower. But if you were to stand there and look at the two mountains, <coughs> excuse me, the more fertile side of Mount Gerizim is facing the more uh, r rugged, rough side of Mount Ebal. And so it, it looks you know, more pleasant on the Gerizim side than the Ebal side, the way you're situated there between those two. But generally, I don't think there's that, evidently there's not that much difference between them really. However, in, in looking into the subject, I found that Mount Gerizim has many springs. It has a, a water supply inside, and that will be symbolic of blessing, especially in the Middle East, you know how precious water is. So Mount Gerizim to the south was the mountain of blessing, and Mount Ebal to the north was the mountain of cursing. Now, why did they do this? Well, there's a, there's a lot of background you can read in Joshua 8, but it goes back to a command that Moses gave them in Deuteronomy 11. So first we'll go there to Deuteronomy 11 just to get the historical background here. And uh, in Deuteronomy 11, verse 29, you see, now which, this is Moses commanding them now, now it shall be when the eternal your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. So now we go to Deuteronomy 27 and we get more specific. And this is where I believe that Moses is prophesying about the end time. So let's go to Deuteronomy 27 and then we're going to go to a prophecy in the book of Revelation or a statement there anyway. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, and I want um, verse 12, I believe. And All right, let's go to verse 11. And uh, if there's any technical problem, I guess I'll find out about it. And Moses commanded, I remember one time I was speaking in a huge auditorium, uh, and, and, and somebody sent me a note and said, the people in one whole section in the upper deck are not hearing you right now. I'm thinking, what am I supposed to do about it? You know, shout up there? But anyway, anyway, uh, Deuteronomy 27, verse 11. And Moses commanded the people of, of, on the same day, saying, These shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have crossed over this Jordan. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. Those tribes were supposed to be there to bless and uh, what about those who were to curse? And these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. Six on each side. Now, it would be very good background to understand the prophetic future of these tribes to study into the origin of the tribes. When they were born, what name their mothers gave them, why they were given those names, the meaning of the names. There's so much there. So you don't need to go to Genesis uh, 29 and 30 and uh, dig into that, the meaning of the names and, uh, and uh, what they say about the characteristic of, of those tribes. And then finally, you want to go to Genesis 35, where the final <coughs> son is born to Jacob and Rachel dies in the process. And this is in, uh, in the 35th chapter, we have the final son born and then we have a statement about the tribes and I always emphasize this when I taught my children about the tribes that there were four branches there are four different mothers of the tribes and it's covered in Genesis 35 around verse 21 uh, well let's go to verse 23 or to verse 22 uh, I, I just the second half of that verse well, I, might, I may as well read the whole verse because you're going to hear about it later anyway. And it happened when Israel dwelt in the, that land. This is Genesis 35, 22, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now, there, there's a sexual, this is obviously sexual, but it's also political. 
uh, because Rachel had died and now uh, Leah was there and she was always a rival of Rachel. Well, Bilha was Rachel's handmaid. <clears throat> so perhaps Reuben thought, well, now that Rachel has died, Bilha will take her place, but I want my mother Leah to have the, 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 the chief place. So perhaps that was another motive for why he uh, had that relationship with Bilha, the sex as well as the politics. Uh, so anyway, uh, now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. So that's one group. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Well, that's a general statement. Eleven of them were. Perhaps she, uh, she got pregnant, perhaps, with the Benjamin when she was up there, but she actually bore him uh, in Canaan. So, but that's a statement, generally speaking, because the 11 of them out of the 12, you know, were, uh, were born up there. And you also had a son, Dinah, uh, I'm sorry, a daughter, Dinah, which, which is talked, uh, who's talked about, uh, I think, earlier in this chapter, or the one before, uh, I think it's chapter 34, right, where you have the discussion about what happened to Dinah. Okay, so that's a general statement so far of where we are. Um, regarding the tribes of Israel. Now, I want to also mention that as background, well, let me, before I go to background, let's go to Revelation 18. In Revelation 18, now we come to an end time scenario. This is now eschatology, end time prophecy. It's the revelation, it's the apocalypse, it's the revealing of what's to come uh, prior to the co second coming of Jesus Christ. And we see this end time Babylon that has arisen and uh, it's interesting what is said about this end time empire, this civilization that uh, dominates much of the world before Christ's return. We see here in the fourth verse where God says, uh, well, let me quote what John says here. And I heard, this is Revelation 18, 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Come out of her, my people. Now that could have a dual meaning. It could certainly refer to, you know, to the church. The church that should not be caught up in this civilization, should not be caught up in that in that uh, debased culture, uh, should not be a part of that. But it also can be talking about God's people, Israel, the Israelitish nations. This political system, which will be also dominated by a false religion, will have various countries associated with it. There will be 10 kings, as you know, if you read earlier, and uh, other countries will be associated with it. And God is telling the Israelitish countries, you'd best uh, uh, get out of there, which would indicate the potential that many of them would be involved in this system. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. So now I do want to uh, go to Genesis 49, where, the, where Jacob gives a prophecy of these tribes uh, as they become nations. Now, to understand this, you also should go back to Genesis 35. There's more material there to study, as well as Genesis 48. Genesis 48 speaks about Ephraim and Manasseh the uh, two sons of Joseph who are risen to the status of tribes. Jacob ri lifts them up to the status of sons rather than grandsons. So that way jo Joseph gets a double portion. So you have an effect uh, in one sense, 13 tribes. And I may say more about that as, as uh, I go along. I probably will. <laughs> so let's go now to Genesis 49. And this is just scratching the surface, but I want this information percolating around because I don't know how many other people are dealing with it. Now, I would recommend a scholar, a historian who attends <clears throat> the United Church of God in uh, Los Angeles, and his name is David Lewis. He's an old friend of mine. <laughs> uh, you know, he's a New York Jew, so that gives us something to, to share. But he's, he's an old friend of mine uh, from back, all the way back in 1979 is when we first met. He's out there in, in Los Angeles, and he has tremendous material on this subject, very scholarly. He's a historian, and uh, he attends, 
a congregation pastored by Robin Weber. So I suppose if you wanted to contact him, maybe you could go through his pastor. And he certainly would be an interesting person to hear from if you ever want to, maybe if you have a local congregation, you want to bring him out to, to spend the day. <laughs> he has so much material. You could spend the whole day on it if, if that's your, your interest. I realize not everybody is made, like, quote unquote into this. But if you are, he, he's a good one to talk to. His name is David Lewis. Anyway, I'm going now to Genesis 49. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you uh, in, in the last days. I'm looking at the clock here. Uh, I don't want to go too long. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Um, I guess I'm going to have to jump a little bit through this because I don't want to take too long, but there could be a Q&A at the end, and we could maybe cover some material I should have gotten into but didn't. Anyway, he talks about Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might. Well, let me just read it. Gather together and hear you, sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Now, this is Hebrew poetry, where thoughts are repeated in different words. Rather than rhyming words, uh, thoughts are rhymed, and thoughts are repeated in different words. It's Hebrew poetry. Brett Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Now, I'm contending that, that France is indicated here. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed. There you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Well, I've already talked about that incident, and it shows something about the problems that Reuben has. Reuben has been as unstable as water. If you study the history of France, you'll find uh, various governments have risen and fallen. The United States has had the same constitution since, you know, we had about a decade where we fussed around and then established a constitution that we've, we've maintained. Uh, and France has had various forms of government over the years. And so although they are a great power, they have not uh, reached the, the, the extent of, of the English speaking peoples. Then he goes on to say, Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council, let not my honor be united in their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. You can read about this, as I said, in Genesis 34. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So instead of taking, like say if you have spice, you know, as one minister told me, you don't take the spice and put it all in one spot. You sprinkle the spice through the food. And so Simeon and Levi are very intense people, and uh, they, they are scattered among the, the other Israelite tribes. But particularly, you find Simeon and Levi uh, among uh, the, the, the Jews and also in the, among the English-speaking people. Uh, many of the Welsh are probably Simeon and Levi. Um, but a lot of Levites, of course, are among the Jews, including your speaker. Uh, Judah, you are he whom your brother or brothers shall praise. This is, of course, a play on the name Judah, which means praise. You are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Well, Judah was the kingly tribe. Judah gives us the Messiah. And in the end time, of course, Judah has had this reputation uh, being surrounded by enemies, but yet doing rather well uh, uh, dealing with them. Um, let me just jump. I won't read every verse of this, of this chapter. I want to go to verse 10. That's quite important. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a scepter from between his feet until Shiloh comes. In other words, the promise of the monarchy, you know, that final king of kings, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed one, he was to come from Judah. And later on, we see a covenant was made with David uh, in 2 Samuel uh, 7 and then in 2 Samuel 23. You know, you find the covenant that was made with David. So it went from Judah and then a particular branch, the family of David. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Shiloh might be, trans might be looked upon as meaning he whose right it is. And to him shall the, be the obedience of the people. I want to jump now to verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships. And, uh, and, and his border shall ad, uh, adjoin Sidon. So he's going to be dealing with, um, with the Lebanese, the Phoenicians, who 
you know, went out and they get all the credit. <laughs> the Phoenicians get all the credit for spreading the alphabet, but Israelites would have probably been among them as well spreading the alphabet. Uh, but you always hear about the Phoenicians. But anyway, so these people of Zebulun are a seafaring people, a merchandising people, and the Netherlands evidently is where modern Zebulun winds up. This car is a strong donkey laying, laying, lying between two burdens. He saw that the rest was good, that rest was good and the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and he became a band of slaves. The, the people, people of Finland have had to keep a kind of low profile. They've been between uh, Russia and Sweden. Uh, they love their land. Sibelius <clears throat> wrote a beautiful piece called Finlandia. Now, let me, let me go to the Hebrew here um, uh, regarding Dan. It says, um, I'm going to uh, the Hebrew text here. Dan yadin amo ka'achad shivtei Yisrael. See, dan yadin, it's, it's a play on words, okay? because that's what Dan means. It means judge, okay? Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Uh, so the people of Dan, which we, I believe to be the people of Southern Ireland, they have provided a lot of political leadership and, and, and law enforcement and so on. Uh, in, in the old days in America, uh, you know, judges and politicians, maybe many of them were of Irish background and the police and fire department, civil, you know, the civil servants were, many of them were of Irish background. And it, it says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heel so that its rider shall fall backward, which could refer to the fact that the Irish were a very you know, big problem for the British and as, as David Lewis was telling me the other day, the British Empire, in effect, began to unwind first by, you know, when the Irish gained their independence. It also could refer to Samson, who came from the tribe of Dan. Now, this is interesting here. Jacob says, I have waited for your salvation, O eternal. Why does he say that regarding Dan? Well, this could be a whole talk. But if you go to Judges 18, you'll find that Dan became involved with idolatry from the, be the begin er earliest times when the Israelites entered the land, Dan became involved in idolatry and continued in that idolatry faithfully right till the end uh, when the tribes were exiled. And so Dan has been involved in, in idolatry. And if you look at Revelation 7, and you have 12,000 of each of the tribes of Israel, uh, I've just got a notice uh, of something that I'm going to talk about at the end. But the, uh, if you look at Revelation 7 and the various tribes of Israel, Dan isn't there among the 144,000. So evidently there'll be Danites in the innumerable multitude, but not 12,000 Danites. <clears throat> they won't fill a quorum so that you can have 12,000 Danites. Why? Because they're going to be so wrapped up in this false religious system that's going to rise up. They'll be part of this a power that's coming up to oppose Jesus Christ. And so although there will be Danites, evidently probably in the innumerable multitude, there won't be 12,000 of them uh, in the 144,000. And so Jacob says, I've waited for your salvation, O eternal. But salvation is coming. Because if you look at Ezekiel 48, when all the tribes are regathered in the millennium, there is a portion of Dan. So it all works out. Dan's going to be there. All right, anyway. Now, I want to go to Gad again in, in the Hebrew Bible. This is uh, in Genesis 49 and verse 19. Gad akev. See how many times you have Gad there? <laughs> it's a Gad Gedudji Gudenu Yagud Akev. So you have a, a play on the name Gad, which means a troop. That Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him and he shall triumph at last. So uh, this, the Swiss. Uh, I believe, or Gad, and they were under the Holy Roman Empire. They became independent and gradually expanded their territory, as we'll see in a moment. Excuse me. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Belgium and Luxembourg. You, you, hear, you hear about Belgium, Belgian lace, Belgian pastry, Belgian sweets, and so on. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. The Swedish people are very attractive people. They had a reputation as being somewhat promiscuous as you know, and also he uses beautiful words. The Nobel Prize originated with Alfred Nobel in Sweden, and most of the Nobel Prizes to this day are awarded in Sweden. Now, I don't, I, there's so much here about Joseph, so I'll just read 
one statement about Joseph here, or I will, I'll read more than one, but not everything. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches went over the, run over the wall. So the people of Joseph are a colonizing people, and they're especially blessed. Joseph got the birthright, and he got a double portion, as I've said earlier. Uh, so let me just read one more thing about verse 26. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of, your, of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. Joseph was unique, specially blessed. And if you look at how the tribes of Israel have settled, they generally border each other, but then you have a bit of a separation and then you have the English speaking people separated. Now we go to the um, verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, and in the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. So this would refer to the Vikings, uh, Norway, and Iceland, and I believe possibly Denmark. Um, now I want to go to Deuteronomy 33. And uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. Oh, I'm not so bad. Okay, let's go to Deuteronomy 33. So hopefully I've planted seeds, so you'll go back and study the, these and do what research you can do and um, delve into these matters. Uh, and as I said, this way it'll percolate around in the community because as I said, I don't know how much this gets talked about anymore. So I want to go to Deuteronomy 33 and um, let's uh, go to uh, verse uh, 6. Okay, I'm in Deuteronomy 33.6. Now, there's a whole lot I could have said, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, as I said, this is planting seeds. This is getting this, these ideas out there. Let Reuben live and not die, nor let his men be few. The French were involved in wars, and that devastated the, the manhood of France. So a special prayer is said, you know, for the ma males of France. And uh, this he said of Judah. He said, Shema Adonai Kol Yehuda. Now you see, Shimon or Simeon uh, is based upon the word to hear. And so he says, hear uh, the voice of Judah. Hear eternal the voice of Judah. So here he's including Simeon in Judah's blessing. As you know, the cities of Simeon were, were within Judah. You know, Simeon was not to have its own distinct territory. Uh, as, uh, and so it was initially they were put within Judah. Later on, some of them migrated into what is, what is the area of Petra and others migrated up into the Northern Kingdom. And so they were carried away with the 10 tribes. Uh, but uh, initially they were given er territory within Judah. And so they're included here. Hear eternal the voice of Judah and bring him to his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him and may you be a help against his enemies. Well, obviously Judah has had a lot of enemies and um, Judah had to be gathered to his people. Uh, in the, at, the, at the end of the 19th century, most Jews were living among Gentiles. But now, in the 21st century, half the Jews of the world are back in their ancestral homeland, and most of the rest are living in the English-speaking nations, and the next largest community is in France. Uh, now, regarding Levi, uh, I'll just go to verse 10. So they were scattered, but they became the priests uh, and teachers of the community. They shall teach, Jake, verse 10. And as I said, many of them are among, uh, the, among the Jews, uh, but there also are Levites in, among the other tribes of Israel. And I think particularly you would find them among the Welsh. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and hold burnt sacrifice on your altar. So you see the Levites who were very intense people, they, they are now used <laughs> to, to, in effect, enforce God's law and to teach it. At the same time, because they were a, a, a rather, their, a tendency towards violence, you know, they can exercise it in a proper way. They can channel their violence by sacrificing animals and sprinkling the blood and, you know, doing those rituals. So that can satisfy that uh, tendency that they have. And of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the eternal shall dwell in safety by him, who shelters him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. I believe this is referring, I mean, obviously these can have many, many meanings, but one meaning is that the temple 
was surrounded by Jewish territory, but there was a little tip of Benjamin that extended into Judah, and Mount Moriah was actually in the territory of Benjamin. So the temple stood on the, on the, in the territory of Benjamin, protected by Judah, but in the territory of Benjamin. And again, of Joseph, there's so much that needs to be said, but I'll just jump down to verse 17. Uh, I believe that the uh, English-speaking peoples are descendants of Joseph. This, is, this explains why they're, they're so blessed, and uh, it explains a great deal uh, about their history. And uh, we have Ephraim, who was given the prerogatives of the firstborn. But Manasseh, because <clears throat> Manasseh was not given the prerogatives of the firstborn, even though he was chronologically, but he became, in effect, a 13th tribe. When this country began, we began with 13 colonies. And if you look at the back of our dollar bill, there's 13s all over the place. <laughs> so 13 is a very much a part of this country's tradition. Even when the southern states seceded from the Union and rebelled, their battle flag had 13 stars. They wanted to have that same tradition of starting out with 13 states. Didn't work out for them. They wound up with 11 states, but they were hoping for 13. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we have Ephraim and Manasseh, and uh, there's a lot of, that I could say about that, but I'll just read this. His glory is like a firstborn bull. You know that the British had that nickname, John Bull, and his horns like the horns of the wild ox. The, ain't, the older translation said unicorn. You know, the British royal family has as their symbol, a lion and a unicorn. Together with them, he shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth. Oh, they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. You know, at one time, a quarter of the world was under the British, and even to this day, uh, Queen, Queen Elizabeth, I think, is, the, is still the queen of about 60 different countries. But, but Manasseh has become that in its own right, you know, <laughs> right now, the great world power, you know, so after the British, but now the, the great world power is, is Manasseh, but it came after the British. And we still speak English here, and our institutions are based on British institutions. And of Zebulun, he said, rejoice, Zebulun, you're going out. As I said, the Dutch were all over the place, Indonesia, you know, South America, and Issachar in your tents. That, that's not been the heritage of the Finns. Uh, there's more I could talk about, but I'll jump to Gad here. I'm in verse 20, okay? And of Gad, he said, blessed is he who enlarges Gad. So I believe that could have various meanings, but they are a people who began as a small area and then grew. Uh, he dwells as a lion and tears the arm and the crown of his head. That may involve the fact that they did have to win their independence. And notice this in verse 21 about the Swiss, Gad. He provided the first part for himself. You know, they have the, perhaps some of the most beautiful land in the world. Because a lawgiver's portion was reserved there. He came with the heads of the people. He administered the justice of the eternal and, the ju and his judgments with Israel. So Gad has a, has a future, according to, 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 to Moses, as being a, 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 a people that judge, that administer justice, that have that kind of role. There are in many, many international organizations that are headquartered in Switzerland. I believe the League of Nations uh, during the, between the two wars, two world wars was, was headquartered there. There are, I believe, 23 international organizations in Geneva alone. You ought, to, you ought to Google sometime, international organizations headquartered in Switzerland. Your head will be swimming. And of Dan, he said, this, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. So the, so the, Dan, the uh, Danites occupied territory, which is now known as the Golan Heights, but they jumped from there and they went to Greece, evidently, and then finally to Ireland. And uh, of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, be satisfied with favor and, and full, full of the blessing of the eternal, possess the west and the south. Well, in, in Israel, the west was the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. So the word for west here is yam, which could also mean sea. So it could be translated, possess the sea and the south. And Naphtali was was uh, located near the Sea of Galilee in ancient times. And today, Sweden is near the North Sea, and I think that it benefits from the South in terms of winds that come up from the South that give it a climate 
that is suitable for, for human habitation, even though they're quite far north. So now I want to go to Asher, very heavily, a very rich country, a very industrialized country. And that's talked about here. Uh, if you read about the Belgium and Luxembourg, how much industry is there and oil refineries are there. And of Asher, he said, Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his, his foot in oil. Now, in ancient times, this would have been olive oil. But nowadays, you know, we use petroleum for fuel. And uh, there's a lot of uh, refineries, as I said, in Belgium. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze as your days so shall your strength be. All right, so I went through just a brief overview. Now, there's a lot to this, but I wanted to just give a brief overview so you get some sense of what, you know, what, what, what's involved here. So I, I hope that you will take this, uh, you know, to use a football analogy, I began talking about football, take the ball and run with it. <laughs> but I do want to get back to what Moses said a few chapters earlier in Deuteronomy 27. In other words, I've said all that to say this, all this background I've given you, and uh, a whole lot less than I should have, <laughs> but to say this, I'm in Deuteronomy 27 now. Uh, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. So these people are not going to be involved in that end time empire. They're going, to, they're going to not be associated with that, what we call the beast power, you know, the false prophet and the beast, a resurrected Roman empire which will be influenced by a false religious system. And, and all, there, all of that background there, which you, you know, if you study Daniel 2, connected with Revelation 17, Daniel 7, connected with Revelation 13, you get the picture of the end time. And we are not there yet, obviously. We're not gonna be here tomorrow or next year. Uh, but uh, just to, you know, to, so that we keep a perspective. And that way we're not misled by people who want us to get hysterical by, by, by whatever's happening in, in, in the, in, in right now. People sometimes want to take right now and read it into the Bible instead of, uh, you know, watching trends and letting the Bible prophecies work themselves out. People want to sort of push things, uh, you know, and that, that's a very dangerous. Uh, let me just say one thing. I hadn't planned to say this. I thought about it, then I didn't. Now I will. I attended a Bible study, my first one in the God's Church, <clears throat> on May 6th of 1968 in Manhattan <clears throat> at the Penn Garden Hotel. It's not there anymore. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> at that time, the minister said, I'm pretty sure he said this, we may only have three and a half years to go. <laughs> that was 1968. Now, he was not being irresponsible. He had reasons to believe that. I believed it at the time myself. You know, so I, I don't want people getting hysterical or being led astray, uh, you know, and I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm just saying that, you know, you have to be careful. Anyway, I'm uh, back to uh, verse 12 here of Deuteronomy 33, of Deuteronomy 27. So uh, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. So here we have the English-speaking people, and we have the Israelis, and we have... Levi and Simeon, who are pretty much, you know, the bulk of them, not, not all of them, but the bulk of them are with either the Israelis or the English-speaking world, not all of them, but the bulk of them. And then we have um, Issachar, Finland, you know, not that, they're not, not that there aren't other pockets elsewhere. That's where David Lewis's scholarship could come in handy. Uh, and then uh, Benjamin, which are the Viking nations, and uh, Norway, Iceland, and perhaps Denmark. Right now, if you look at the European Union, the British are leaving. You've heard of Brexit. The British are leaving. Norway never was in it. <clears throat> uh, Denmark is in it, but Greenland, which is under Danish control, is not in it. And um, Finland, there's talk now of Finland maybe, that maybe they want to leave. But even so, the European Union is not necessarily this end-time power, but uh, that it, it's, a, it's a kind of beginning of European nations getting this idea of cooperating together in some kind of federation. So it's a kind of, you know, foreshadowing of that end time power. But you see, it's already beginning to peel off and nations that are peeling off, you know, are, 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 are here in, in uh, verse 12 of um, Deuteronomy 33. Now I want to go to those nations that will be part of that, of that end time system. And, and these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse. So we have Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. So we have 
Southern Ireland, and we have the French, the Swiss, the Belgians, Luxembourg, and, uh, and then Sweden. If you look at, and of course, and the Netherlands. And you, if you look at these countries, you can see for various reasons why they could be part of that system. Perhaps, you know, voluntarily in some cases, maybe pressured into it, you know, not thinking they have much choice, but one way or the other, you know, that they would easily be wrapped up in that end time system. In other words, basically it's the, the continental European countries, not the ones on the fringe, except for the Swedes. But, but the Swedes culturally have, have, um, have had a certain connection with Germany. You know, they, they, they did not oppose Germany, as far as I know, in the First World War. They were neutral, technically, in the Second World War. Uh, so uh, there's a certain, I think, cultural relationship there. So this gives us a, a general idea of how these nations are going to finally line up when we come to the end time, whenever that is. And here it is all the way back in Deuteronomy 27. So that's why I call this talk Moses in End Time Geopolitics. Here we have this, these passages that a, a discerning student of the Bible can see in these passages a certain guide as to how geopolitics are going to line up in the end time. It's really fascinating. Now, I want to say in conclusion, you know, that um, we want to be alert spiritually as long as we live, because we don't know when the end is going to be. And I gave this information, as I said, because I want this, this, these ideas out there. I want them percolating around, circulating around. I want people to be thinking about them. But I'm not saying that, that they are going to be immediately applicable. But they're, they're certainly something to be aware of as you, as you see uh, trends over the years. So I do want to finish by going to the book of Philippians. And even though this was written to the church at Philippi, it even includes the Philippines, and it includes anybody else who's a, who has a right relationship to God, with God, through Jesus Christ. And eventually I'll get there. I keep flipping around. Uh, <laughs> all right. So anyway... Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, all right. So here's Philippians, the first chapter, and here's what the Apostle Paul tells them. So this is for anybody listening. If, you're, if, you're a, if you have a right relationship with God uh, through Jesus Christ, Paul tells you in verse 6 of Philippians 1, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So let that be an inspiration to all of us who, who are part of this study. So uh, I would like now, I hope that that has been uh, of benefit and help and uh, maybe has stirred some uh, further study and discussion and thought and prayer and whatever. And um, if anybody has anything you want to talk about, about anything in the Bible, uh, feel free to do it. Okay, um, if anyone has any questions or thoughts. Um... Let me just say this, okay? Uh, I do have an announcement I need to make. Remember I said I had an announcement? Another very sco important scholar, scholar in our community, John Hopkinson, who worked with Dr. Hay for many years, uh, has had heart uh, problems and uh, has been hospitalized. And I don't know his present state, but um, I think that he uh, an operation took place which if you know assuming it all went well will 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 solve this problem at least in the immediate future but john hopkinson uh has had heart problems and and does need your prayers he lives in uh, southern california and many of you at least maybe have heard of him or maybe know him john hopkinson so please pray for him and his family so other than that uh, anything that anybody wants to say yeah just open up your mic and um ask or if we turn on your webcam and we can see you asking the question or making the comment and for those on the phone you just have to make your comment we can't see you <laughs> if if somebody wants to delve into some of these matters if you ha if you have um problems with what i've said <laughs> or or you want to delve into it uh you can uh contact me. I suppose you could go through the, the church email, cck153 
at earthlink.net, cck153 at earthlink.net. Also, I give messages every week on YouTube, uh, cck153, I give, I give, and I have also many, many messages out there that are brief ones, condensed messages on various subjects. There's now a, quite a, a large archive of them. So I hope, I, and I, I went back and looked at a few and saw that, that people were watching. So that's good. The more the merrier, you know. So uh, I just want to let everybody know that. So as I said, if you want to delve into these matters further, then feel free to e email me and uh, we can get into it at, at, in greater depth. I realize that these are subjects are somewhat controversial. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I certainly appreciate uh, whatever point of view, you know, you, that, that is politely expressed. <laughs> so it sounds like it sounds like we have a quiet audience tonight. Okay, well, I appreciate I want to tell you, I really appreciate being asked to make the, make this presentation. I mean, he didn't tell me what to talk about, but he, he gave me the floor for the evening. So I thank you, Don, for that. Thank you for giving me the floor, giving me a chance. I to think I think of it more as uh, I give you the floor so God can inspire you for what we need to hear. Okay, well, I hope that's the case, you know, as they say, from your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much then. Have a wonderful Sabbath and uh, Appreciate those of you who were who were listening or viewing. Thanks very much. <laughs>